And hello, welcome to another edition of What the Papers Are Saying, where we bring you the big stories for the week. My name is Vivian Kai Local. My guests for today are two gentlemen with um, City FM and City TV. Bernard Kokoavla is a host of the City Breakfast Show, as well as the general manager for City TV and City FM, as well as Selom I don't know who is the head of features and articles here at City FM and City TV. We'll be right back. Stay with us. So you can be part of this conversation. You can send us a message via Facebook or Twitter on City TV or City FM or on any of us our, um, hashtags or our, um, um, what do you call it? Um, our Twitter, uh, Twitter handles, handles or Facebook. Handles. <laughs> and um, you can also send us a WhatsApp message on the number will scroll very soon on your screens. Uh, thank you for joining us. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me. It is, so, a, it is a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so let's pleasure. see what the papers um, have been reporting throughout the week and start with the Ghanaian Times. A very sad story they reported today. Two cops gunned down. That's how the Daily Graphic captured that tragic story we heard yesterday. The Daily Graphic also captured that story. It says IGP places 10,000 CD bounty on cops killer. That's the um, graphic on that um, sad story. And then City Newsroom goes with start arming MTTD officers to reduce killings. That's the interior minister speaking, uh, actually telling that to the IGP. The Chronicle says two cops gunned down, suspects arrested. And then the Daily Guide reported it this way, two police officers killed. Let's move on to another story that has been making rounds, not just this week, but last week as well, um, on the uh, PPA saga. And the Ghanaian Observer captured it this way, contracts for sales saga respond in 10 days. The Ghanaian Observer says, PPA boss to face SP and Shraj. The Ghanaian publisher says, Shraj summons ABJ. And City Newsroom captured it this way, TDL never sold contracts, claims fabricated. That's the suspended PPA boss's lawyer. He spoke um, this evening with um, City News. Also, the Ghanaian Observer says, PPA boss to face SP Shrash, that was earlier, he has um, gone to see the special prosecutor. And then um, City Newsroom captured it this way. I'm being suspended for nothing. That's the former boss or the suspended boss of uh, PPA speaking. Let's go to another story which has been um, trending for quite some time now. The NDC primaries, they went to the primaries on Saturday. How did the um, papers report the that activity. The Daily Guide says NDC elections, nine MPs sacked, Oye Letha shocked. The Chronicle says Oye Letha gets bloody nose at Adenta. While the new publisher says NDC picks MPs. The informer says Ghana's democracy in danger, obviously related to the um, buying of votes that we've seen around this election. Then the new crusading guy says, an actor knocks out Valerie Sawyer's boy. And then the Daily Graphic says, nine incumbents fall. While the Independent says, surprises at NDC's primaries. Nine NDC MPs lose 2020 bids. The Inquisitor says, Wabi and Samoa rubbishes won't to me his claims. So that's it for the um, NDC's primaries. And another story that um, came out during this week was the letter, open letter to President Nana Kofuado from Buzia's daughter. And the uh, CNR brings it and says, Buzia's daughter's open petition to Nanado. So we'll be looking at these stories and many more in a bit. So let me start with um, the first story to do with um, the killing of two cops. Very sad one, very tragic one. Um, Bernard, how did we get here? First of all, let me give you some um, quick statistics on these um, killings. We're told um, just over a period of one month, we've had um, 
um, five police officers killed. We had uh, Sergeant Agatha Nana Nabin. She was shot dead by men in a saloon car that was signaled to stop at a snap checkpoint at Kumbungu Tamale Road in the northern region. That was July 2019. In August 2019, Lance Corporal Hassan Asari was also killed by an own assailant while on night guard duty at Duke's filling station in the eastern region. Corporal Bernard Entry, your namesake Bernard, <laughs> um, August 21st this year also killed with a heavy metal by unknown persons who gave him a lift at Mansur Ab Abodom in the Ashanti region. And then just yesterday, two of uh, two police officers with the Kaswa MTTD were also shot dead after an unknown man in an unregistered silent car opened fire on them following a hot chase over reckless driving. And then we know over six years, 30 have been killed as well. How it, did we it, get it here? Is, it is absolutely shocking to see the brazen nature that this last one occurred. As you rightly said, in the past month, uh, from 30th July, 20th August, 21st August, and now 28th August, you've had five police personnel die from not natural causes, from gunshot now, if you just look at the numbers and compare to previous years, it's not such a big story. But to have five occur within a month, it's very serious. First thing we need to say is that all of us need to send our condolences to the families of these police people. I listened to the, the, the husband of uh, uh, Sergeant Nabin, the lady who was killed yeah. on, on 30th July, and he says, He's utterly devastated. He doesn't know how he's going to take care of his daughters. So a lot of times when we do these stories, we discuss it from the hard point of X number of policemen. Yeah, let's get know. them uniforms. Let's get them body cameras. The human side of having a spouse, a husband or a wife, being in the line of fire every day is a very serious thing, especially in a country where we are severely under-policed. There are not enough police per Ghanaian citizens. So these people are outnumbered, they are ill-equipped, some people feel they are under-trained, and they are working in a very hostile environment of growing criminality. <coughs> you are having urban sprawl, which means that a lot of social vice is happening. And the levels of violence we are seeing on television, the levels of violence we are seeing in armed robbery attacks, places these men and women in extreme danger. So for me, the first thing I'll say is that let's look at the human side of this. Imagine if your husband is a police person. He tells you he's going to work to make law and order prevail. And you see on television that he's been shot. It's completely unbelievable and very sad. Now, I like the fact that the IGP, the interior minister, the director of welfare, took the time to go to the houses of these police people. Mm -hmm because morale can be weakened yeah. when you see somebody who served his country die in this way. <clears throat> so I, I like to start from the human side. This is a very tragic human story of having somebody cut short, their life cut short in the line of duty. duty. And this throws families into years of poverty where you have a one breadwinner in most cases who's bringing some money to the house, sometimes three or four kids, mm. and there's no money at home. And I really hope the police administration and the interior ministry, beyond simply the posthumous promotion of these police people, implement a proper welfare package for spouses of police. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. Number two, <clears throat> with the kind of democracy we have and the society we form, the economic injustice, there will always be criminal elements. So our police, we don't just need to increase police numbers. We need to invest in training that reshapes the mindset of the police. The past few months, because of the war against indiscipline, I've been privileged to be talking and working a bit more closely with the police. And I'll tell you that just like here at CTFM, there are certain jobs you know that if I give it to Hansen, he will do it better than if I give it to this person. They know those who are good and those who are bad. They are as concerned about professionalism as we all are. Mm -hmm. And they are very determined to do well as an administration. The trouble is that the setup of the police does not allow them to air out their grievances as ordinary people can. So journalists can make noise. Textile workers can make noise. 
police cannot come and say the standards of training have come down. We don't have our best given to us. Okay. Salary levels are low. We don't, have, we don't have guns. They can't say that. We have to see and preempt <clears throat> and supply them. Now, if you look at the, the increasing numbers of criminality in the society and the fact that the police are outnumbered, and a lot of our police don't have the right equipment to work with, it's a big issue. Mm -hmm. So you look at the way these police people were shot. These were MTTD police. We know the way they dress that the MTTD police, most of them are not armed. They are not armed. Right? Clearly, criminals <coughs> have killed them because they've taken advantage of the fact that they are not armed. The natural response would be, well, let's get them arms. Let's buy body cameras. Yeah. But I think that that's just the initial response. And I know you come to that. But it looks like in, in Ghana, our, our knee-jerk reaction to problems is a procurement solution. Let's buy them cars. Let's put on body cameras. Let's have CCTVs. Mm -hmm. Those are just the obvious parts of the problem. To really deal with this issue, look at the structure of the police service. How is it set up? What kind of recruitment do they have? How do we improve their effectiveness? How do we equip them to do more than preemptive policing? Do you, do you get my point? Now, these are very general points. The other point I need to make is that the police administration must be swift in dealing with these miscreants. Luckily, in respect of these two people who were killed, three people have been arrested by a joint effort of police and the community. Because what we have been made to understand by the Central Regional Police Commander that when the incident occurred and the police were called, they cordoned off a wide area, worked with local people, and fished out the criminals. And I think in this pain and sadness, this solution they've crafted in arresting three people presents to us the ideal way of response citizens and police working together. You've listened to eyewitnesses in some of the reports talking about what they saw and how that helped the police arrest the suspects. Mm -hmm. And I think where we are going, the mindset of Ghanaians and the way they think about police, that the police is to, to be partnered by citizens to help preemptively deal with crime and to help report crime. That's where we should go. You can buy 10,000 guns, buy them 20,000 vehicles, give them all the body cameras. If citizens will not cooperate with them, give them leads. And if the police will not behave in ways that will gain our trust, this is going to continue. So I'm not going to say I'm shocked that somebody thought they could shoot a police person. There are bad people in society. Our response should be from the human, the cultural, before the logistical. Citizens who are angry by this, should decide that they will be the eyes and ears of the police on the ground, okay. that their relationship with the police is going to change. Then the logistical responses and the welfare responses will then be more, much deeper. Okay. We'll come to the logistics because um, the Interior Minister, for example, has ordered the IGP to now um, think of arming MTTD, for example. There are some uh, people like uh, Vladimir Chidanso who have said that even if you look at the situation from the information he has, they, they don't even have the right um, um, logistics or whatever. For example, in the UK, some of the watches they have, their cameras, some of the hats, whatever, their cameras. So you could have easily seen who they are and then follow suit that we don't have all that. They just wear their white and black and all that. Same goes with the other police officers and all that. For us to really look at the type of um, um, logistics we give to these police officers and all that. But let's pick um, Salom's initial reaction to, to this story and then we come to that. And how, whether the police have been effective so far in getting people behind these issues. But because don't forget, we've had five. Whether <laughs> we've been able to get all of them or some of them and whatever is another discussion we can look at. But Salom, your initial uh, reaction to this um, sad story. Uh, well, <clears throat> I, I think it's. Uh it's unfortunate and it is sad that we've come to this stage uh, of having police officers being killed on, on, on duty. It is sad and we empathize with the, the families, the, the children, the, the wives of, of these fallen heroes. They, they are heroes. Like the, uh, the interior minister said, these are martyrs, so we should see them as such. Um, it's not the first time this has happened. It's, it's happened over the years. In the last six years, we understand about 20 of such instances have happened. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think the response from the police service <coughs> is important. And let me use this opportunity to commend the, the acting IGP. I think since he took over, he, he's, he's been, he's been quite to proactive. All these five and he's tried to do 
the human things, yes. the soft things. Mm -hmm. So, for example, when he took over, he went to the, 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 the homes of the Takradi yes. the kidnapped girls yes. and, and spoke with them. That, you know, gives the people involved some hope and, and, and some feeling that the authorities or the institutions that be are, are with them in their mm -hmm. grief. So that is fine. I also like the fact that this happened yesterday. Just today, you know, a high-powered delegation from the police service went to the homes of the people to commiserate with them. I think it's great. But, you know, m moving it beyond this, I think that a lot of the measures which have been spoken about are, are just knee-jerk, you know, reactions mm -hmm. and responses. It's the same way we treat a lot of things. So th there's been talk about, you know, giving them bulletproof yeah, vests. Vest there's that. been talks about giving them body cams or mm -hmm. body cameras. Mm -hmm. There's been talk about arming them. But, you know, if you don't you give agree them, with that. No, no, I, do I that agree. You know, it, it, is, it, is, it is a comprehensive package. It is not just doing things in isolation. You don't just give them bulletproofs and you, you bulletproof vest and you expect everything to be fine. The bulletproof vest only covers, the vest only covers their body. Their heads yeah. are, are left naked. Mm -hmm. And in this particular instance, we hear they were the shot head. at the yeah. head or in the head yeah. and they died. So the person could be wearing a vest, but it, it, it wouldn't be very useful. But I'm not saying it vests, a bit of I'm not saying the vests are not important, but I'm looking at a more comprehensive approach. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we talk about arming the police people, giving them weapons. Can we imagine a situation where every MTTD officer standing by the roadside is holding a gun or, 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 or a firearm? It's even dangerous to themselves and it's dangerous to the citizenry. Some of them don't even know how to use their guns properly. We've had instances where guns have been snatched from police officers. Now, you're going to give police each police officer, MTTD officer, people who stand just by the roadside checking minor traffic offenses, you know, working as traffic wardens, etc. You're going to give them guns? I don't think it's the solution. I think the solution is a bit deeper than that. The other point, the, the, the other thing which has also come up is, is about giving them body cameras, etc. It's mm -hmm. good. We've tried over the years to talk about retooling the police service. We've been trying to retool them. We've been trying to give them cars. The cars are good, but it goes deeper than the car. So they are the car, they chase these guys, but the guys ended up killing them. I think the solution to, to this will be, you know... Probably because they knew they were not armed and the worst will be to shoot at you because you can't shoot at me back. You don't have what I have. Because to have um, decided to get out of the car and then open a boot and all that time, I mean, it comes back to the training, like Bernard said earlier, and they still allow them to get out, open the boot without being instructed to open the boot, and then take out a gun and still stand there and watch them shoot at them. There, so, there so, are a lot no, of issues with that. Ex exactly the point. So it exposes, you know, a number of things. What kinds of people do we have in the police service? What kinds of training are they giving? What is their natural, you know, predisposition? Are they security alert people? All these things are important things to see in people before recruiting them to the, to the police service. So, for example, we have these guys we're talking about, they went to their car, got a gun, etc. And these <coughs> guns are not just locally manufactured guns. My understanding is that these days, the, 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 the crimes or the guns involved in the kinds of crimes we see are not just locally manufactured guns. They are very sophisticated guns, AK-47s, P3s, etc. Mm. How, how did they get these guns? You know who trained them to use these guns? Jesus These God. are issues we should be. We, we should. This gun was I actually think, registered to a gentleman. I think Wade was so, and he's yes, actually and, somebody they are looking for. Yes, and, and and we cannot find. We don't know whether he, he is one of them Those or they who, got yes. a gun from somewhere. Yeah. You know, we, we just don't know. And then we we await what the investigations will, 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 will bring. But my point is that the police needs to go back to the drawing table and then re-strategize. Crime has changed. Crime has become more sophisticated. You know, the criminals have become smarter. And if they are operating along a certain line and they see that the police are not catching up, they, 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 they become more devastating. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they ensure they cause more damage than, than, than we can even anticipate. We need the police to get more alert. We need the police to get better trained. We, we need the police. I mean, their recruitment must be looked at again. A lot of the time we have people with, with, with political links getting into the police service. We have people going to the police service because... They, 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 they just need employment. We don't have people or we don't have a lot of the people who go to the police service because they are passionate about policing and all they want to do is, is to be police officers. I think we need to look at these things well so that because you, 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 you can't, it's not a one size fits all approach. Yeah. We, we need to develop a root and branch approach to it so that we can deal with the specific issues and the detailed issues appropriately. Just saying, let's, let's give them guns, let's give them vests, 
let's give them body camps, good. But the other things we must look at, and in my view, we should look at the training, we should ensure that we upgrade the curriculum. What kinds of things are they, are they being taught? Is it the same things we were learning 10, 20 years ago, they are learning today? Meanwhile, crime is, 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 is changed, it's Change become more sophisticated. I think there should also be a lot more collaboration between the police and other security agencies. A lot of these sophisticated guns we are talking about, or weapons we are talking about, a lot of them w were brought into the country through the borders. How are the customs and immigration people, you know, at the <coughs> borders? What kinds of checks do they, do they carry out on people entering the system? Somebody mm -hmm. tells me that the police people sometimes are even afraid of flashy cars. When they see flashy cars, they, they, they don't feel confident in approaching the cars and, and, mm -hmm. and doing the kind of search you would have done on a normal or average car. Because they are scared it's a big man or a big and, woman. And, and, and that is exactly what we must, we must discourage. Yeah, for me, I'm just, I just, if I can, if I may come mm. in. So while I, I think it's important to talk about police training and everything else, I think that what happened today was pure criminality Yesterday. based on what we've seen. And no matter how well trained the person is, if you, are, if you stop an unregistered vehicle and you ask the person to step out of the car, you, you wouldn't expect the person to shoot you and chase you with five bullets in your head. <coughs> so while I agree that we need to discuss training and everything, I think we need to look at this from the point of view of the, the brazenness of the attack and what would have emboldened the people to do this. Today, Dr. Enin was interviewed by Umar Rosanda on Eyewitness News, and he says there have been more police who have been attacked in their police stations in the line of duty in the last five years than even those oh, who have been attacked by the road. This week, there was a story that police in some parts of Sabalugu <coughs> went to do an arrest, and the townsfolk attacked, attacked the police, them, yes. and the woman had a gun. Yeah, yeah. So for that me, we should look at this from some of the, the brazenness of the attack, the rising disdain and disrespect and intolerance exactly. for what police for is police, doing, yeah. for somebody to do such a thing. It's not just about training. I think, as we've said, the society we've generated, there's a lot of lawlessness. Now, because of the spatial dimensions of lawlessness, the anonymity of living in places where nobody knows where you are, poor national identification, there are people who live in this country who don't know whether they are from Ghana or from wherever. We don't know who they are. We don't know how many small arms they have. We must deal with all those factors in order to protect our police and let them do better. So it's not just about police training. But um, sh shouldn't we be worried about the level of attacks on the police now? What is leading to people not having knowing that I can just attack or kill a policeman and, I mean, life goes on. Well, Should, uh, I, I, think I, I think we have to look at every issue in isolation. So, you, you need, for example, if you're discussing what happened in Kumbungu, where the uh, lady, Nanabin, was killed, you need to look at, we travel in the northern region, mm -hmm. join the Heritage Caravan. <coughs> For every 10 or so kilometers, you see a police post with a couple of policemen with guns. But there's a lot of bush. Mm -hmm. There's poor visibility. So in the night, people can attack the police at the police post and run away if there isn't rapid response. Mm -hmm. So you should discuss that from the perspective of how the place is laid out, the amount of police people dotted there, the kinds of weaponry they have, and the reinforcement that they have. That's one angle. Okay. And look at the north and its closeness to the Burkina border and the kinds of things happening there. Versus, say, Kaswa, mm -hmm. a densely populated peri-urban area, a confluence of many things where you have people in a vehicle. Don't forget, we've interviewed people who say on the road from Budumbura coming to Kaswa, they were attacked. They went to the police. The police didn't do anything. Do you get my point? Yes. So you, even though you are right in saying the attacks are getting more brazen and the reports are alarming, we have to look at the specific cases. For some of the communities, for example, don't forget that a few years ago, a, a soldier was killed in Dintra mm -hmm. Part of this could be the local issues and the relationships with the security forces there. But what is clear is that there's a lot of intolerance for law and order, mm -hmm. partly because we have allowed misbehavior to fester and not punish it. We have not treated crime as crime. We've had people call. We've done, even on the war against indiscipline, where people break the law and they make phone calls and threaten police that I'll get you sacked. Yes. Do you get me? So we have reduced the po police's authority by our own actions. Mm -hmm. So the brazenness is because people feel that they are above the law and that they can get away with it. That's the issue. A lot of the investigations into these killings never get to the bottom of the matter. If we are 
determined as a society to let law and order prevail and we bring perpetrators and their accomplices to book, people will fear. If people can go into a court and chase out people and they are given fines, you are sending it. Look, the culture of any society is the behavior its leaders permit, whether it's in your house, in this company, or in a country. If somebody breaks the law and you say, well, he's a friend of this person, he's in this party, or he's in that category, so let's spare him, you embolden others. So it's not just about police professionalism, it's okay. about what society has permitted. So my final point is that let's use these incidents to show the police that we will allow them to do their work. Okay. If we do that, that's the starting point. Then we can do the other things of equipping and all those and the things training that are required. Know. Okay. Yes. So you're watching um, what the papers are saying. My name is Vivian Kai. Look, I'm here with um, Bernard Avle as well as Selma Adonu. Um, when we return, we'll tell you the latest on the PPA saga. Stay with us. Ghana Rising 2019, a conference to optimize opportunities for indigenous local businesses to rise up and take their place in Ghana's economy. How can you take advantage of the local content laws in the oil and gas sector? How can you benefit from the new initiatives in the agriculture sector? How can your business penetrate the sanitation and environment industry in Ghana? Ghana Rising 2019, it's time to energize indigenous participation in the agriculture, oil and gas, sanitation and environment sectors in Ghana. Ghana Rising 2019. Theme, taking commanding heights of the Ghanaian economy. Opportunities for indigenous businesses. Date, the 19th of September 2019. Venue, Kenpinski Gold Coast Hotel. To register, call 0205-973-973 or 0550-900-006. Register today at the front desk of City FM and City TV behind the Adabraka Police Station. Ghana Rising is sponsored by Sun Power Innovations, Ghana Exim Bank, and Climate Innovation Center, Ghana. Ghana Rising 2019 is supported by 97.3 City FM and City TV. The biggest corporate sports competition, the City Business Olympics, returns for another grand event. Does your team have what it takes to win on the field of play? Does your team have the grit to dethrone the current overall champions, GCB Bank? Then bring it on and show us what you got on the City Business Olympics 2019. Participate in games like seven aside football, swimming, volleyball, basketball, tug of war, tennis, and new challenges like plank walk, tag team sack race, the CEO's challenge, and many more. It's a day of teamwork, skill, strength, endurance, with all the fun and networking as corporate Ghana gathers to show us what they're made of outside the boardrooms and meetings. The City Business Olympics happening on Saturday, 21st September 2019 at the Bema Camp Sports Complex. Time, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Call 0205-973-973 for more details and registration. The City Business Olympics is powered by 97.3 CTFM and supported by CTTV and citybusinessnews.com. City Business Olympics, bridging the gap in our corporate world through sports. So yeah, welcome to what the papers are saying. Welcome back. I have um, Stella Madonu and Bernard Avila um, helping dissect the issues for the week, uh, the big stories, the papers, and... Uh, online portals have um, reported. Now the latest is the uh, PPA saga and the PPA um, suspended boss has been speaking, his lawyer has been speaking as well. Let me just um, bring you a quick story on what um, he has been saying. Now the suspended chief executive officer of the Public Procurement Authority has said he is unnecessarily being vilified by Ghanaians over unsubstantiated claims of corruption leveled against him. Quote, the public is simply speaking words of untruth. I regret the way I'm being crucified for doing nothing. He told the media after his interrogation by the special prosecutor. Now investigators are the office of the special prosecutor questioned him today. He arrived at the office at um, around 10 a.m. And then let me pick a quick one from his lawyer. Uh, Gaston Obua, who is insisting that his client's company, Talent Discovery Limited Incorporated, never sold contracts to other um, companies. Now, he's also um, quoted as saying that um, 
whoever bought a contract from us should come and tell us that I have bought a contract from TDL. We have not sold any contracts. Let him, which is Manasa Azuri Awoni, show us a signed contract that TDL has entered into with any company. We do not have any contract for sale. This is another fabrication. Interesting twist of affairs, guys. <laughs> Hello. I mean, certainly, uh, <laughs> you, you, you don't expect him to go down without a fight. And, and the lawyer is just doing his job. I mean, trying to raise the issues to, 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 to create doubts, what we call reasonable doubts in the minds of, of all reasonable people. So, for example, I mean, he, he says that uh, his client hasn't sold any contract to anybody. He could be making a technical point, but the point he's making is his client didn't sell a contract to anybody. And so if you bought a contract from him, mm -hmm. then, then you, sh you, you show up or you, or you come forward. And the question is, what did Menasse do in that regard? Menasse tried buying a contract, and he succeeded in securing that contract as far as the documentary was concerned. So what, what, what is his point? What is he saying? We also know that per the laws of our land, you know, a, a person is, is, is presumed innocent until proven guilty. So that is exactly what um, he, his lawyer is doing, trying to claim that, you know, the, 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 the allegations and some of the things in the video were fabricated. I mean, you should expect him to say a lot of these things. But the point which caught my, which caught my, which caught my attention in the lawyer's, you know, uh, interview to the press was saying that Manasseh just went to the TDL place and then met anybody and, yeah, then paid, and, and then paid money to somebody. The man he paid the money to or the man he was engaged in a transaction with mm. was a general manager of the TDL company. Mm -hmm. He was a general manager. And in, in simple agent principal relations, the agent has the authority to, to bind his principal, and he has the authority to enter into legal relations or create legal relations with a third party. So what's he talking about? Is he saying that the gentleman who took the money did it solely on his own, and didn't he do it in the name of the company? So I think these are issues that we will need to have clarity to in, in, the, in the coming days. My other point is that he did not do this alone. The, MD, the, the, the ministries, agencies, and departments were there. The, the PPA did, did not come up with the contract. What the PPA did was just to look at the procedure or the processes and see if the processes were followed through and the processes were good. The contracts actually came from the, the ministries, I mean, Works and Housing, you know, Special Development Initiative, etc. They actually advertised and then shortlisted the people and then took them through the PPA processes. The point is, when the PPA board was considering all these contracts, and the gentleman said he had disclosed his interest in the matter or in the in the in the his interest in the company and in the contract <coughs> to the board. The point is if you are a board and your chief executive tells you that he has an interest in this company, what due diligence do you do? And even before that, in the documentary, he tells when Manasseh asked him uh, whether he had a company, you know, or whether the company belonged to him, he said no, it belonged to his cousin. His cousin. So what exactly was a disclosure? He made to the board. Did he tell the board it was his cousin's company, or he told the board it was his company, or it was a company he had a 50% share in? I think we need to know that. And if he just told the board that it was, the co it was his cousin's company, what due diligence did the board do? Did the board go behind him to find out which people were behind it? Did they try to lift their veil, or did, did they try to seek some clarity from the Registrar General's Department to find out which people were actually behind the company? And if it were just one or two contracts going to, that's fine. But how about 13 to 14 contracts, the same person or the same company, and that company with your chief executive having interest in it, winning as many as 13 or 14 contracts, and nothing pricked the board to, to, to ask questions. For me, I think that is where the, 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 the bigger chunk of the matter is. As for the processes, they'll go through the processes. Today and tomorrow, perhaps, is the office of the special prosecutor, which is you know, probing the matter. I'm sure in the next few days, the, the, the charge will also start. And they will do all the investigate, and if they find a prima facie case, put a docket together. I'm sure they will go to, I mean, they, they may go to court or they may go to the Attorney General's Department. Of course, OSP has the, the power to prosecute on its own. So it, 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 it will be an interesting next few days to see. But of course, what the lawyer said is what is to be expected. That is his client, and his client is presumed innocent until, I mean, proven guilty. Proven guilty. So exactly what he said, I mean, what he said is exactly what he has to say as a lawyer. You know, I, I, I despair for this country, honestly. When, I, when I, I sort of watched the video, 
that an, uh, uh, Manasseh did, if what he's put out is to be believed, I don't even know why we are talking so much here. But of course, a man is innocent until proven guilty. So he deserves his right to be heard properly. So based on what we've seen, conflict of interest is very clear. I'm not a lawyer, but if you are the head of a procurement agency and a company that you have interest in has access to contracts and is willing to even discuss with somebody the possibility of how to win a contract, mm -hmm. even if the contract hasn't been sold, you are the one who is enforcing the standards of procurement. So fairness <coughs> and rule of law, you must be above board. So you can't have interest in a company that purports to even deal in contracts. Do you understand my point? Yes. So I feel that the, the way we even perceive conflict of interest in this country is problematic. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at even the banking crisis, most of the things the banks were doing, and I'll come back to the main point, there were clear conflict of interest issues. But when you listen to some of the people who ran their banks, they didn't see the big deal. Mm -hmm. So I feel we, our, our, we, we have a very interesting sense of what is right and wrong when it comes to conflict of interest. Maybe we write laws based on British common law that our values don't even think are wrong. <laughs> Maybe. Because if you listen to those who are even angry from the MPP saying the guy should be sacked, most of them are angry because of the shame <laughs> he's brought to the party because he's been caught. Not because they don't know that these things can be happening. Do you get my point? So we tolerate a lot of corruption because we've normalized it. Appearances of conflict of interest persist in many, in many business models. In fact, the business is <coughs> built on the concept that <laughs> I will use my knowledge and closeness to this to profit this other business. Mm -hmm. The business model is based on that. And yet when it's blown out, we all shout and we all cry woof because po corruption is good political capital. It's good to win power or appearing to fight it is good to retain power. But the values don't frown on it because they bring the proceeds to church and we collect it and pray for them. We line up in the night and collect money from the same corrupt people. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel that it's, I'm not surprised all the things I'm hearing, that in the face of all of this, people are saying, well, somebody hasn't bought a contract. It's not about buying a contract. If I'm the head of public procurement, and somebody says, Bernard, come and be <laughs> part of a company that even has access to contracts. What business do I have? Mm -hmm. Do you understand know I me? Mean? So we shouldn't even be having this conversation at all. So I, I, I really think that we have to try and build a society where there's shame, there's honor in, in being clean, where people don't just present an appearance of wanting to be fair, but actually are fair. Okay. I can't go into the nitty gritty. The other point I need to make is that even before the, the Manasseh work, or, uh, 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 Special Prosecutor has told us that he was already investigating this case. Mm -hmm. Now, the least I know about Special Prosecutor is he won't investigate a case if there's no primary fasci belief that something wrong could be going on. So if the, audit, if the Special Prosecutor is to be believed, he's been working on this case with the Auditor General before Manasseh came in to tell the story in the very powerful way he told it. Mm -hmm. So my point is that, so from the Auditor General to Special Prosecutor, you already have questions to answer. And now a journalist has also done an expose to show that there were things that were untoward. I think that we really need to get serious as a society in not tolerating such things and letting people in authority know that we have to raise the standard of behavior of people who guide the public purse. Mm -hmm. That's okay. what I think we should do. So that then these, these kinds of things, so it shouldn't just be outrage for a day. We should go beyond the outrage and say, all those concerns, as Selom said, the board, clearly the board was lax. Okay. And as GII and CDD and co are saying, the board needs to step aside as well until the full investigation is over. And let's use this to reform our procurement. Because don't forget, procurement was a major... I interviewed uh, candidate Akufado on CTFM, where he said, Restrictive and soul sourcing have become the order of the day. That can't be right. Hmm. So wrong under a, a previous government should also be wrong here. Yeah. Procurement economy. I've already told you that because of the, the police matter, procurement is the easy response. So people create an economy out of our needs. Right? 
So we need to read between the lines and be and raise the procurement conversation above simply having a minister for procurement. Okay. That's what I would say on, okay. on this matter. Let me take a, a few of okay. your messages that I'm coming to. Let me take a, a few messages to bring in our viewers. Um, this is Hamed Suleiman from Kumasi. He says, there's no shame in Ghana again. Upon everything that we see, the lawyer for ABAJ is saying claims were fabricated. God save Ghana. And then this one says, the issue of the numerical strength of the police vis-a-vis -vis the nation's population is not the problem. Why should the policemen jump on a vehicle and chase the unregistered vehicle? Why should the policemen assume that the occupants were unarmed? Could the policemen have communicated with their friends ahead of the escaping vehicle? For me, the police invited their death because the chase was unnecessary. This is from Divine. Um, Joseph from Borga says, from the eyewitness report, we were told the suspect told the policeman he was going back into his car to pick money after he was slapped. Professionally, the police shouldn't have taken things for granted. Um, this one says, good, ev good evening, Vivian, and evening to your panelists. Talking about policing in Ghana is... Uh, a policeman is killed by an un unknown gunman. It's sad there are situations where innocent civilians are also killed by policemen um, themselves. In order to avoid these occurrences, a police force should be more professional in their dealings. I think that will help. Um, this one says, this is Toma from Mancra. So it says, from the way ABIJ, the don't call me contract seller. Oh, okay, let me just say. From the <laughs> way ABIJ is confidently speaking, I can say without any doubt that the clearing agent has given him assurance. That, oh, guys, come on. I'll move to that. Um, you another see, I told, one. I told you that politic, uh, it's, uh, corruption is easy for political gain. So a lot of people who even complain about it, it's not because they are outraged. It's because for them, it will help them to, to look better. Mm -hmm. So the anger is not even real. That's uh, what troubles and, me. And even okay. people from his party who, yeah, who, who, are, who are complaining, you know, when you listen to them closely, they will tell you the man is greedy. He, he likes to chop alone. He, he doesn't them. spread the wealth. So not really you know, on the core issue no, of it's, it's, who, it's, lost, it's, who didn't it's, get a did more of a enjoying them. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but to a more substantive <laughs> point, I think this also exposes what we hold dear as a people. It exposes what we hold as values, wealth, the, you know, our, our inability to question wealth or raise legitimate questions about people who, 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 who have wealth or people who show wealth. For example, I, I hear he's a church elder. He has a front seat in church. Nobody questions where he makes his money from, oh, my brother. you know. <laughs> and and, and we, we need to ask some of these questions. The other point is that now, Nobody cares about ethical leadership. Nobody cares about moral leadership. Where, you know, honesty is manifested. We don't see any of these things anymore. The society is, 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 is on a slippery slope. And if you don't take care, we, where we will end will not be, will not be nice. Okay. Uh, the, the other point is that if anybody finds himself in public service, that person should know that it is a higher calling. It's a higher calling to serve in the public space hmm. because the... the, the the standards are higher. It is different from being in a private space. If I were a private person, I decide who to buy from, and I decide what to buy. But if you are in a public space, you know, using the public's money, there's a procedure, there's a process you must go through to get or buy what you want to buy. That is the difference you must know. And once you're in public office, bear in mind that the standards are higher. And once we, we, we realize that and we are ready to hold on to those higher standards, I think our society will be reformed. I think our society will be better. Okay. Okay. Um, let's move on to our next topic. Another story that has been developing over the period has to do with uh, the importation or uh, alleged importation of school uniforms. And um, you spoke to Aruna um, Idrisu today on your show. He, um, he said, government is not doing enough to protect the textile industry. Now, the minority leader in parliament, Aruna Idrisu, has attributed the decline of the local textiles industry to government's inaction and misplaced priorities. This follows claims by the Textile Workers Union of an alleged importation of material for the new uniforms introduced by the Ghana Education Service. The Ghana Education Service um, has reacted to that story. It says, we have not imported new uniforms. Disregard textiles workers' claims. Now, the Ghana Education Service has asked the general public to disregard the claims by the Textiles Workers Union that government had imported its new uniform for junior high schools. According to the GES, it has not awarded any contract to any local or foreign firm to bring the fabric into the country. 
country and it goes mm. on and on and on and on. Well, this is a very interesting story <laughs> because I think that the, there's been a few things misunderstood about this story. So the Graphic published a story a couple of days ago and said, and I think I have the paper here, it says, Cash, clothes dealers cashing on new uniforms. So this is the story. Mm -hmm. Then the textile work, in the story, the reporter said that when they, they went to the market, they found out that there were very few people who were selling the new uniform. Because even though the government had said <coughs> that the uniform was open, and GS had said that anybody could sell it on the open market, it appeared only a few people knew where or were sort of procured, were supplying the materials. All right. Then somehow the, the textile workers said they feel a bit betrayed because they felt that when this issue first came up, the Akosombo Textiles was supposed to be the one giving the sort of contract. Mm -hmm. So they are surprised that it's on the open market, some of which are imported. Do you get me? So how come it's on the open market and it's a free for all? Because the open market is already skewed towards importers. Yeah. Do you get my point? So the textile uh, guy, uh, uh, Ibrahim Kunsi, was alarmed and said, how can government open this up and encourage imports? He used the word encourage imports. And the government said, well, we have not given anybody a contract to import. We've just made it open. Do you, do you get my point? Mm -hmm. Now, there are a couple of issues here. You need to understand that the textile industry is a, a text, an industry that's symptomatic of our economic decline and our industrial decline. In the mid-70s, 14 textile companies producing over 60% capacity, employing about 25,000 people. Mm -hmm. Now, in employ less than 4,000 people, only four companies. In 2011, we were exporting <laughs> about $285 million worth of textiles. It declined till 2016, up to $24 million. The industry is in decline. Jobs are being lost. Government decides to stimulate the industry, $17 million, to give the industry a boost. Do remove VAT. Have only one import entry point to reduce smuggling, to revamp the industry. You watch CNR this evening. ATL says things are getting better. Mm -hmm. So my problem is, if you have a policy that's going to bring school uniforms in, what's the best way to enhance what you've started with the local textile manufacturers? Give them a contract. Mm -hmm. So to say we have not even given a contract doesn't solve the problem for me. Maybe uh, the workers are accusing you of something different that you haven't done. But my problem with government is, policies must be coordinated. If you've given money to you have a few textile companies that you are trying to revamp. Mm -hmm. There are three key issues with most industries. Number one, market access. Number two, government or domestic support. Number three, export competitiveness, right? Market access. You can't give access to everybody to your market. Mm -hmm. China, Nigeria, everywhere. They have to obey some rules. Domestic support, subsidies, remove taxes, cost of power. Cost of power in Ghana is the second highest in West Africa, apart from Guinea-Bissau. Cost of credit, highest in Africa. Mm -hmm. If you set up a textile factory, even if you are close to Akosombo, if the cost of power is high, if the cost of uh, credit is high, you can't be competitive. So you can't be export competitive. That's why exports are falling. Okay? And then, number three, you don't have access to markets. Because people are smuggling the goods in, mm -hmm. they are not paying taxes, you're suffering. So my problem yeah. is, saying that we have not given anybody a contract, for me, even exposes a bigger problem. Mm -hmm. Why don't you see the new school uniform as a way of enhancing the profitability and the market of these companies that you are supporting with 17 million? Do you get my point? Yeah. Why should you leave it free for all? Free for all. If you say we should all run 100 meters and I can run it in 12 seconds, somebody can run it in <laughs> 5 seconds. If you, give it a, if you make it free, you are disadvantaging the weak. The purpose of a government well, in this case is, are your is to your use its policy to strengthen its local companies. Mm -hmm. So to say, we have not given anybody a contract, we've made it open, it may respond to what you are being falsely accused of doing, but it doesn't ad ad address what I see as the bigger problem. Okay, Bernard, hold on to your thought. We have to take a quick break. When we come then, you, you continue oh, with your, your thoughts on this matter. You're watching what the papers are saying. I'm here with um, Bernard Avle as well as uh, Salam Adonu. My name is Vivian Kai. Look, we'll stay with us. We'll bring you more on this topic.
It's a new and exciting season of the Premier League with the Premier League Preview Show on City TV. Get the best opinions, build up, and team news ahead of each match week in the season to help you stay in the loop. Is Fantasy League your thing? No worries. Get all the tips and hacks from our in house expert and put the competition to sleep. If you come up against teams like Liverpool, for example, in the Premier League, in the opening day of the Premier League season, Liverpool arguably one of the best teams in the Premier League, you're not going to get a lot of chances. You're not going to be able to play that sort of flamboyant football. It's the Premier League preview show every Friday at 3 p.m. only on City TV. So you're welcome back to the, what the papers are saying. Um, Bernard, you are making some interesting points of that. I mean, you are, your trade minister has come up with a policy to support your textile industry. There's a, a 17 million stimulus package. You have, you have a tax policy that's zero rating VAT because you want your textile industry to be competitive. There's a new textile company which is a Ghanaian-American collaboration. You are trying to revamp the industry. If you've created a policy of school uniform which is new, which you, you are going to face in in the next three years. What's the best way of supporting this textile co company? Mm -hmm. What law will you break if you say, we think that the design should be supplied by the four local companies? Even let them bid for it. So that you even say that schools that want to procure should procure from these people. Living into the open market when your borders are porous, your companies can't compete with foreign imports from other places like China. You've not achieved anything. Then why are you even... Government should, for example, another example, rice. If you, want to, if you want to say school feeding program or fertilizer, you've just opened the largest fertilizer company in Ghana. Why should you be importing fertilizer and leave it open? Other countries are using government policy to help their local companies. And you are saying, we haven't given a contract to anybody, so leave us alone. And you want me to clap for you? No. <laughs> you need to say, and, this, and you see, the reason this upsets me is that even Haruna interviewed today, during his tenure, President Mahama said, we have a shoe factory in Kumasi. Police and soldiers should buy shoes from the shoe factory. They didn't buy. I, how can you convince me that we are serious about developing our local market? We pay lip service to it. And I think the trade minister should find a way of saying that if we are going to do this school uniform thing, let's use it to enhance the strength of our local textile companies. Let's restrict it. Okay. That's the way to show that you are coordinating policy. Okay. Hmm. I mean, yes, very good point Bernard has made. Uh, the, the little, what I want to add really is to emphasize the role of government policy. You know, the, 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 what the situation brings to the fore for me is, you know, the clear case of, you know, the lack of a proper and coherent government policy to help our local industries grow. So, so like the point you rightly made, if you say you've not given a contract to anybody, and so you leave the thing to be free for all, it's, it's very likely that our local industries, which are not doing well, which you said you've, you've, you've given some stimulus package to so they can grow and do better, it's very likely that they'll, they'll, be, they'll, they'll, be, you know, uh, they'll be beaten in the competition because they do not have the capacity to compete. So I would have expected that you know, when this came, Government would have said, "Okay, we're, we're putting where we're putting our our money where our mouth is. Let the local companies, let our local textiles company have this contract. Let them do this and supply to to the retailers or to the wholesalers, and let them sell, so that we know that a chunk of these materials or these fabrics which will come into the system would have been produced by our local people. We didn't see anything like that, and so it also makes nonsense of this whole campaign about see Ghana, eat Ghana, wear Ghana." This, is, this was actually supposed to have been where Ghana. But we have a case where people will go to China, contract people to do it for them, and then they bring it to Ghana. The local industry will suffer. Local people working in the local areas will not get any, any, any profit from this whole school uniform change. I think it's a failure on government, okay. of government. I think it's, it shows government inability to put its I mean, money where its mouth is. I don't know if it's too late. I mean, schools are reopening next week. I don't know if it's too late. And it's good they're actually facing it out. It's not as if everybody must buy it at the same time. I think it leaves government some opportunity to correct 
or to right its wrongs. Okay. Now let's do our uh, final story quickly. We just have five minutes to do that. Um, on the NDC's primaries, NDC elections, nine MPs sacked. Oye Elisa shocked. Another one, Oye Elisa gets bloody nose at Adenta. And then vote buying rocks NDC's primaries. Two issues. Big names fall and then the For vote me, the, big, the big issue there is we need to open up our political system. What we have now is a, well, a system of political entrepreneurship. People come and say, Vivian, you are from La. You are very intelligent. Go and run for MP. We'll give you money. You, you, you start running for MP if you think you want to run. You need money from people because you need to pay delegates to be given the whichever party you support ticket. Mm -hmm. We need to open up the system. We need to create a political system where the money question is properly answered so that more competent people can get into office and give people a fairer chance. How do you do that? Broaden the delegate base so that it's more difficult to bribe people. How can you have a country where you have over 4 million voters and yet the number of people who choose half of the key MPs are less than 20,000? Mm -hmm. It's not a fair process. Open it up. Number two, funding of political parties must be dealt with. <coughs> Very important <coughs> because political parties don't mean present audited accounts. You don't even know where they get their money from. A lot of bad money will get into politics. Right now, when you have a, a wrong system that brings people to power, they can't deliver the right results because they are beholden to all kinds of forces. There's so many things they can't do. There's so many policies that they can't take because we've let a few people hijack the process. If you open up the system, then you're going to have better governance. So if you want better results, start with the way people are selected. Otherwise, you can get a saint and put him there. He can't do jack because the guys who put him there who hold a gun to his head. That's right. Tell him. Yes. Um, the, uh, I mean, the democracy uh, we, we practice has been, I mean, it's now been described variously by people as becoming a monocracy, where it's only the rich and, and, and people who have connections with rich people are able to get through. So I listened to uh, Francis Xavier Susu recent, I mean, yesterday or two days ago, and he said he spent about 300,000 Ghana cities just to win his party's nomination. Mm -hmm. The main election hasn't come. The main yeah. election will be more difficult even than the, the primaries. And this is Madina. Mm -hmm. In fact, the current MP is MPP, is MPP yeah. which means you may have to spend more to, to, to defeat him or to beat him or to win the seat. He's already spent 300,000 cities just to win his party's nomination. And it's not a done deal. It's mm -hmm. not like a voter region seat mm -hmm. or an Ashanti region seat where for the automatically MPP. Gets you know, where, the where, where once you win the primaries, you automatically in parliament. Now, the questions we must ask are these. Who, who were the people? Who are the people who supported him? I'm not sure it's the ordinary party people. Indeed, the ordinary party people expect him to give them money. <laughs> I mean, one of the candidates was telling me that sometimes you can just be around. They will call you, hey, madam. Seven years ago, more money. To this city, present me talk credit. Okay, okay, you okay. know, things like that. We can't continue doing things like that. Right. We, we need to open the system up. The NDC started this universal adult suffrage thing where every Cadbury member of the party yeah. voted. And as Ras Barak said, that was a cleaner system. Indeed, that would be a cleaner system because you can't influence everybody mm -hmm. using money. Yeah. But what happened? The NDC quickly stopped that process because it wasn't favorable to the cause. I understand it bred, you know, apathy because the delegates who actually are the branch executives and the real grassroots soldiers or foot soldiers felt that their sources of income had been taken away from them. So they said, okay, now that you have taken this away, everybody is voting, let everybody go and do their job. So there well, was that, apathy. That's what we actually need. Yes, there, there was apathy. And then now people who were supposed to actually go down there to do their work said they will not do it because they now had no source of income. You okay. see, that is a discussion we must continue having. And, and, and for people to know that choosing leaders, you're not doing the person a favor. You're actually doing yourself a favor by choosing the right leaders. Okay. Because when they come, their policies will affect you, and their policies will create environments for you to thrive and do, and do better. Okay, our time is up. We have to go. <laughs> and thank you very much, Bernard Avila, host of uh, the City Breakfast Show, also general manager for City TV and City FM, and Salom Adonu, um, head of features and articles here at City FM. My name is Vivian Kai Loko. Thank you so much for joining us. See you next week. Goodbye.